Okay, this uh, lecture is on water basically and the environment. So we're going to see some of the properties of water and a little bit about uh, pH and the environment. So the first slide here, water makes life possible on Earth and that it does. Uh, that's why you look at um, the news and they talk about finding uh, water planets. They're trying to find planets that it will never reach, you know, uh, not currently, uh, that are that, that water can exist in liquid form, vapor, and ice. So if water is there, since water is a common element to life as we know it also, um, they figure life could possibly be there or it could support life. Water is the only common substance to existence in the natural environment in all three physical states, solid, liquid, gas. Yeah, that exists in all states in the environment. The structure of the polar molecule allows it to interact with other molecules. Remember I told you that polar molecules attract or are attracted to other polar molecules. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's look at that water molecule I told you about in the last chapter. Here is water molecule in the middle and it can form hydrogen bonds with four surrounding water molecules. Remember each of the water molecules has an oxygen atom in there and oxygen has a very high electronegativity. So look at the one in the middle. You see that oxygen is trying to form hydrogen bonds with the hydrogens of two other water molecules around it. At the same time, the upper top one and the one at about four o'clock, their oxygens are trying to form hydrogen bonds with the water molecule in the middle. So each water molecule has four hydrogen bonds surrounding it. That's going to give it some of its characteristics, like its fluid uh, viscosity. The viscosity or the thickness of a fluid is based on water. Water has a viscosity of one. And other solutions like honey, oil, syrup, alcohol, gasoline, they have different viscosity factors because they flow at different rates than water does when it's put through a, a test of a particular size tube. So it affects the viscosity or the thickness. New terms. First one, cohesion. The attraction of a water molecule to other water molecules. Okay, the hydrogen bonding between the polar molecules. So the hydrogen bonding is, is basically what cohesion is all about. Water molecules being attracted to other water molecules by the hydrogen bonds. That's cohesion. Adhesion, the attraction to a wettable or charged surface. So this is going to be polar being attracted to polar. And like it says here, water is attracted to another polar molecule like cellulose and paper. So the adhesion has to do with polar attractions, polar attracted to polar. The attraction to a wettable or charged surface. Wettable, uh, like cellulose, it is wettable. It can attract water because the cellulose is a polar molecule. Water is attracted to the cellulose. It pulls other water molecules behind it. So as each water molecule is progressing, into that cellulose paper towel by being a, the, the advancing water molecules are being attracted to each of the cellulose molecules and they're pulling behind them. Each one's pulling four water molecules, which are also pouring, pulling four that are there, hydrogen bonded to and so on and so on. So that water is being pulled up into that cellulose towel by adhesion, the attraction to wettable surface or other charged other polar molecules. Now capillarity, the attraction of water to a solid structure. If you've ever seen a, uh, a glass tube that you put water in, it does, it's not straight across it, across the, uh, the water. It, it troughs and the edges of the water are higher than the center of the water. It's called a meniscus. And you'll see that in your lab exercise. We have these things called capillary tubes that we attract uh, or take up blood for uh, doing things like uh, donating blood or for doing something called a uh, hematocrit where you find out the amount of red blood cells versus plasma in your blood. So here's a capillary tube and a glass capillary tube for blood. 
it'll it's actually sucked up into that tube by capillarity and it only sucks up so far though so it can suck up a certain distance and that's it um, the vascular system in plants plants have these things called sieve tubes and these sieve tubes are just millions of them and they're side by side uh, in plant material and they are tubular and they have holes in them or they're permeable for water to, to go in and out of the tubule through these little holes. Well, since the capillarity will only suck or allow water to be drawn up so high in that solid structure, when there's another tube next to it, it can also be attracted into that tubule and it pulls the, by capillarity, it goes up a certain distance in that tubule, which is next to one that's next to it, and it transfers from that tubule to the one next to it and it gets pulled up even higher. So water moves up like a snaking fashion. You know, it snakes its way up plants, going from one tube to the next tube to the next tube as it moves up each tubule by capillarity. See, this says uh, three or 400 feet high. That's some pretty powerful suction on that plant by capillarity. Now surface tension here, here's what I do my little insect on top of water and you know, they spread their legs out to disperse their weight so that no one, one point has enough weight on it to break the hydrogen bonds. That's how they walk on top of water. They're also kind of light. So surface tension, water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds. And there I put the little picture showing how each molecule has four hydrogen bonds around it. This allows water to remain liquid and reduces evaporation. Uh, because since each water molecule has four hydrogen bonds associated with it, it's going to be harder for water to leave the mass and go into the atmosphere because of the hydrogen bonds holding it. And you see this little insect again. All those water molecules have four hydrogen bonds between each water molecule, and so it's a little bit of a force there that has to be broken. And by spreading its weight out across the surface of the water, no one point of that insect's mass you know, their weight is enough to break all the hydrogen bonds so they can walk on water. Water transport. This is in plants. Uh, a partial vacuum is created by water evaporation at the leaf. When water leaves the leaf. I have it in the definition down here. One has to be pulled to replace it. So I wrote this little definition down here or explanation. As a molecule of water is lost from the leaf to the atmosphere, it pulls a water molecule to replace it. Now, you remember, each water molecule is attached by hydrogen bonds to four other water molecules, or there are four bonds. That molecule pulls one to replace it, and so on, all the way down the plant to the roots, which remove water from the soil. So when that one is lost, it pulls one to replace it, and that one pulls water molecules behind it, and so on, and so on all the way down to the source in the soil. And when the uh, soil gets deficient of water, the plant loses enough water to where it starts to wilt over. And we'll talk about that uh, also. It's called plasmolysis. Some properties of water. Uh, well, kinetic energy is one. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Now that's for just about anything, any molecules, uh, they're, they're all moving. There is molecular motion, an atomic motion. So the energy of motion is called kinetic energy. I gave you some, some examples. When you swing a pool cue, that's energy being uh, kinetically transferred by the energy of motion. That pool cue is moving forward. It hits the pool cue ball and stops. The energy is transferred into that cue ball, and which goes across the table to hit the racked balls and the energy is transformed or transferred to those balls and they start rolling across the table transferring energy into the table. Electrons moving through a wire like for uh, incandescent bulbs that have a filament in there when you turn the light on electrons start moving through that filament and there's a lot of friction because that filament is so thin and that uh, generates more heat. The movement of electrons generates friction that gives off heat and a lot of the energy is given off in the form of light. Water behind a dam. Have you ever seen a dam before? The water level on one side is higher than the other. The water on the lake side, that's called potential energy, because it, it has a potential to, to flow, to move, goes through the dam when they open the, the, uh, the gates, 
and it goes through the dam and flows past the turbines which spin and generate energy for electricity and then it goes out the other end of the dam and the kinetic energy of water moving down the stream continues. So kinetic energy is the energy of motion. A car going down the street, that's kinetic energy. A baseball being thrown, that's kinetic energy. An arrow being fired from the bow to the target, that's kinetic energy. So it's the energy of motion. And molecules have kinetic energy. They are moving also. And their rate of movement can be um, um, determined. We have a way of measuring it. Heat, this is how we measure it. Heat, kinetic energy is the result that results from the random movement of molecules. The faster molecular movement results in what we call heat. So when things are hot, the molecular movement is rapid. It has a high kinetic energy. Microwaves from your microwave in your kitchen excite water molecules in the food items you put in there. It makes them move faster. When they move faster, that's heat, it gets hot. So that's how you make oatmeal or heat up a meat or heat up bread. Uh, there's water in there and the energy from the microwaves excites the molecules and they move faster. That's higher kinetic energy. Put a paper towel in there and turn on the microwave and nothing happens because there's no water in that paper towel. Heat is responsible for the weather and ocean temperature. You probably noticed that um, they talk about uh, highs and lows and they talk about you know, a cold front and a warm front that move into an area. Well, that's what they're talking about. And it does affect the weather patterns also. Here's how we measure kinetic energy. Temperature. We have things called thermometers that we use to measure the kinetic energy, which we call temperature of something. Temperature is a measure of the heat due to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So we have thermometers and we measure like uh, these temperature equivalents here. This is uh, the freezing point of, of water, zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, 212 Fahrenheit. Now we kind of flow in between those two uh, units. Uh, we talk about if freezing outside, we go to the 32 degrees Fahrenheit. When we talk about boiling water, we talk, we're talking about 100 degrees Celsius. Your body temperature, 98.7, 98.6 or 7 Fahrenheit. Well, in Europe, it's 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, temperature in rooms. The school used to have thermometers that registered in uh, Celsius, and it was always around 23 degrees is what it was in the rooms, Celsius. Now they've changed them to Fahrenheit, 68 to 77. That's more what we use like for outside temperatures. I like that 32 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 and 77 is also used for outside temperatures. So we have ways of measuring this. We have thermometers now. Used to, they were mercury thermometers. They still make mercury thermometers for certain types of uh, measurements. But now most of them have alcohol because mercury is toxic and you know poisonous to your system. Uh, and we have uh, other ones that use infrared to measure in energy. You move them across someone's forehead, and it tells you what the temperature is by the amount of infrared uh, energy, which you can't see. Uh, they have some that they use at the school that are little lasers. And they they'll 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 point them at a, uh, a an air duct two stories up, and the device will point out what the temperature is according to what happened to that light when it hit the uh, the vent. So they can they can measure from distances. We have one that measures lava flows in Hawaii. If you get close enough, you can aim it at the at the lava, and it can tell you what the temperature of the lava is. So it's the average kinetic energy of you know, molecular movement. More terms, <clears throat> calorie, you've heard of that before. The amount of heat energy it takes to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree centigrade. Centigrade and Celsius are the same thing. So it's one gram of water, one degree Celsius or centigrade. Well, that's one calorie, one gram of water, one degree centigrade. Well, a kilocalorie, that's a thousand calories the amount of heat energy it takes to raise the temperature of a thousand grams of water, one degree centigrade. So you're talking about the number of grams of water, one calorie, one gram, a kilocalorie, a thousand grams, 
by one degree centigrade or Celsius. And there are devices called, they're called them bomb calorimeters, that they will put a food material in this center tank that's filled with oxygen and they seal it. And they submerse it in a known amount of water. It's in another cylinder, which has a thermometer on the side of that cylinder. The materials inside are ignited by a spark. Now, oxygen is very flammable, so that material in there is going to burn up real quickly. And the heat is going to be absorbed by that inside cylinder, transferred to the water between that cylinder and the tank outside. And the thermometer is going to rise a certain degree, a certain number of degrees uh, centigrade. And so they can tell how many calories were in that food material. That's how they do that. Water has a high specific heat. Now the specific heat, let's see what that is. The ability of water to absorb a large amount of heat without a large change in temperature. Okay, well pools are like that. If you have a pool and it's been real cold outside and then like in Texas we have a day that's in the 90s the next day, you're not going to go dropping in that pool because that water is still cold. It will take several days for the heat to leave that, that water. I mean the heat to warm that water up. Um, it doesn't gain or lose uh, heat quickly, okay? So that's what that means, high specific heat. The ability of water to absorb a large amount of heat without a large gain or change in temperature, it also takes a while for it to lose it. The Hawaiian Islands I put there because they're a landmass out in the boondocks of the Pacific Ocean. So you would think that during the day, that when the sun is out, that the islands would fry then it's that landmass out there with all that sunlight around it would fry it. But that's not what happens because the water around those landmasses absorbs the heat during the day. And at night, when the sun's gone and that landmass is out in the middle of the ocean, uh, you would think it would freeze. But it doesn't because at nighttime, water loses the heat to the environment. And so it cools the islands during the day and it warms them at night. It keeps them kind of tropical. Water has a high heat of vaporization. That means it takes a lot of heat to vaporize water, to break those hydrogen bonds. So it says water requires a large amount of heat to vaporize it into a gas, a large amount of kinetic energy to vaporize it into a gas. Now I wrote down below, hydrogen bonds require energy to break their bonds. That allows the molecules to move rapidly and to escape from the surface. So if the uh, water has uh, more energy applied to it, like from microwave or from an, an you know, an, an, a stove top with a heated element, the water molecules are absorbing or gaining that kinetic energy. And they're moving faster and faster and faster until they move fast enough for the hydrogen bonds to release their grip. They break. And then water can move from the mass into the atmosphere. And that's where you see water vapor. Enough heat has been applied to the water to surpass you know, the hydrogen bonds hold, and they leave uh, the water mass and go into the environment. That's the high heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of kinetic energy to break those hydrogen bonds so that water molecules can leave the mass. Another unique property of water, says the water is most dense at four degrees Celsius. Well, you see an ice cube here, you see the water around it. When water gets cold, and most things do, the water becomes more dense. The molecules move closer together, like on the far right side. Water becomes more dense. But at four degrees, it starts around five and it goes to four, this happens, the water molecules reverse and they move further apart. And when they do that, they, they form ice crystals. And so ice crystals, yes, they're made of water, but they're less dense than the water they're sitting in. And so they are lighter and they float. That's why ice floats on top of water. That's why icebergs float in the ocean. The water is cold, but it's not as cold as the ice. The water molecules have gotten colder, they move further apart, and they're less dense. And so that ice mass is lighter than the water it's sitting in, less dense, and it floats. The 
This is another slide that uh, we will look at the components of. Water is the solvent of life. I've told you before that uh, life as we know it depends on water. You have to have water for life as we know it. And we're going to look at some of these uh, definitions here. A solution. A solution is a solvent plus a solute. Solutes are dissolved in the solvents. Now, if we get a, uh, a sugar water solution, the solvent is water, and the solute that you dissolve in that water is the sugar. It makes sugar water. When you look at like a fruit juice, the solvent's water, and there are many solutes that are dissolved in that water to make that solution you know, for the fruit juice, like uh, orange juice or something. Coffee, that's a solution also. You have water, and whatever solutes came out of those coffee beans, they're now dissolved in that water to make the solution called coffee. Same thing with tea. Same thing with soft drinks. Water is a good solvent for polar solutes, such as proteins, carbohydrates, and ions. Your plasma is a lot of water. It's mostly water, and you have proteins like uh, uh, antibodies, those are in there, carbohydrates, glucose is in there, ions, sodium, chlorine, potassium, calcium, they're all floating around in there. So uh, water is a good uh, uh, solvent for those solutes. So a solution is a solvent plus solute. Now an aqueous solution, aqueous solution is going to be one that's mostly water. Uh, those are going to be your your, you know, your juices, your coffees, your teas, that kind of stuff. Let's look at the next slide. Yeah, aqueous solutions, mostly water with other substances dissolved in it. So aqueous means water. And that would be like your tea, your coffee, your Cokes, your juices, your Gatorades, all those things. Now, gasoline is not an aqueous solution. It's a petroleum product. It has no water in it. So it's different. It's not aqueous. It's still a liquid, but it's not aqueous. And gasoline is not aqueous either. Some terms. Hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Hydro is water, and phobias are fears. Fear of water. These molecules are nonpolar or non-ionic. They're not charged. Remember, water is charged. It's a polar molecule, and water is attracted to polar molecules. It is not attracted at all to a nonpolar molecule. So these oils, like oils, lipids, cell membranes, uh, the molecules are hydrophobic, water-fearing. They're nonpolar. Now, the cell membranes have two sides. One side is polar, and one side is nonpolar. That's why it's put there. But you know that oils float in water. When you're making spaghetti, you're supposed to put some, you know, a teaspoon or tablespoon or whatever of uh, vegetable oil or something like an oil in there. Uh, you notice that it, it bubbles up on the top. It does not mix with that water. So it is a hydrophobic, water-fearing. It's as far away from water as it can. It's not attracted at all to water. Hydrophilic. Hydro water. Philic means lover of, hydrophilic, water loving. These molecules are polar or ionic, like cellulose is polar, and uh, the ions like chlorine, potassium, hydrogen, those are all uh, ions. They're attracted to water also. So I put down here cellulose has many positive and negative charges, and water adheres to it. Polars are attracted to polars. Hydrophilic means water loving. Molarity. Ah, molarity says, look at the definition first. Knowing the molarity allows us to know the number of particles of a substance, that's the solute, in a solution. Now we would think about the concentration. You know, that's another term that we would use as a common term. It's the concentration of something. Is it concentrated or is it weak? You know, like on teas, like you could make tea, you have sweet tea, which is sweet, or you could get like Whataburger tea, which is really sweet. Those are different molarities. They have different amounts of, of glucose in them. So let's look at what molarity is. Molarity allows us to know the number of particles of a substance in a solution. We have different molarities for acids. I went to chemistry and asked them for a little bit of hydrochloric acid, and they wanted me to tell them what molarity I wanted because they, were, they had different ones. They had a 1, a 2, and a 5, I think. 
I just wanted a weak acid, so I got, I got the molarity of 1. So let's see how we figure out molarity. The molecular mass is the first thing you're going to do. Get the molecular mass of that molecule. The sum of the atomic mass of all the atoms that make up the molecule. So I have a molecule over here. I don't know why this, this shifted here, but CH2O, that if you look at it, remember it's one carbon, two hydrogens, one oxygen. All right, well, it says the atomic mass, that was the number below the element, is the number of protons and neutrons, right? So one carbon atom, okay, one carbon atom has a mass of 12. If you look on your periodic table of the elements, you'll see its mass is 12. So one, one atom of carbon, one mass, 12. Two atoms of, of hydrogen, mass of one, two times one is two. One atom of oxygen, its mass is 16. One times 16 is 16. So the molecular mass is 12 plus 2 plus 16, which is 30. So the molecular mass of a molecule of CH2O is 30. Well, here's one that we would deal, we're going to be dealing with uh, most of the time here. This is glucose down here, C6H12O6. It says it has six carbons. Okay, with six carbons, that's six times the mass of each one. 6 times 12 is 72. It's 12 hydrogens, so 12 times the mass of hydrogen, which is 1, is 12. There's 6 oxygens, so 6 times the mass of each oxygen atom, which is 16, which is 96. When you add 72, 12, and 96, that gives you the molecular mass of 180. So that's the first thing you have to do for figuring out molarity, is get the molecular mass of the molecule. Now, a mole, a mole is the molecular mass that you just got of a substance expressed in grams. So one mole of CH2O is 30 grams. Its molecular mass was 30, one mole is 30 grams. One mole of, of uh, glucose there is 180 uh, grams. Its mass was 180. So a mole is the molecular mass expressed in grams. It's 180, gram, 180 grams you'd weigh out for one mole of glucose. Okay? So it's just the molecular mass expressed in grams. Whatever that number is, the molecular mass number is, that number of grams of that is called a mole. So now you're getting into a, a weight, a gram weight. It's called a mole. So molarity. How do we do the molarity now? <clears throat> the number of moles of solute in one liter of water. That's a, that's a, a set amount, one liter of water. So a one molar solution of sodium chloride, ah, a new molecule. The mass of sodium is 23. And you see sodium chloride, there's one sodium and one chloride. The chloride, the mass is 35. You add those together, 58. That's the molecular mass of sodium chloride. So one mole of sodium chloride is the molecular mass expressed in grams. So a one mole is 58 grams. Now, molarity, the number of moles of solute in one liter of water. So a one molar solution of sodium chloride is one mole of sodium chloride, which is 58 grams, in one liter of water. That makes a one molar solution. So you could do a half molar, a 0.5 molar. That's weaker. It's 29 grams. That's a half of a mole, isn't it? Half of 58 is, 20, uh, is 29 in one liter of water. Okay, so still one liter of water. What if you wanted to make a two molar solution of sodium chloride? How many grams of sodium chloride would be in one liter of water? It'd be 116 grams. That make it even more concentrated, right? More salty. So a two molar is 116 grams of sodium chloride in one liter of water. So molarity isn't that big of a deal. It's, it's, it's not that threatening. How water dissociates. This is just a standard acceptance that water comes apart into hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions, okay? That's how water dissociates. It comes apart into hydrogen and hydroxyl. This is how we'll always accept it. 
and see hydrogen is a cation, hydroxyl ion is an anion. Positive for hydrogen, negative for hydroxyl. Now pH, we're not going to get real deep into pH. I just want you to understand what makes pH change, basically. So the definition is always going to be this, whether it's chemistry, physics, or whatever, biology, whatever. The negative logarithm of the hydrogen of the hydrogen ion concentration of a solution. Okay, that's going to be the definition, and we're not getting into logs and stuff, so don't worry about that. There is an inverse relationship between hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ion concentration of the solution. You're only dealing with those two, and their amount, their abundance, is going to affect the pH. It's an inverse relationship, and we'll see that on the scale. The pH scale ranges from 0, which is the most acidic, to 14, which is the most alkaline, the most basic. A pH of 7 is neutral, meaning that the solution contains equal numbers of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions. Since hydrogen ions contribute an acid factor to a solution, and hydroxyl ions secrete an alkaline uh, trait to a solution, if they're equal, they form metabolic water. They cancel each other out. Equal amounts of hydrogen and hydroxyl ion, it's a pH of 7. That's the middle of the scale from 0 to 14. And it's shown in your log thing as 10 to the minus 7th moles of hydrogen ions and hydroxyl ions. That's a pH of 7. So that 10 to the minus 7th, that's a pH of 7. Uh, 1 10 millionth mole per liter. Okay, well, don't worry about that. Here's our pH uh, scale. Ranges from 0 to 14. And you see I have it. The top is 0. The bottom's 14. And in the middle, you have pure water. A pH of 7 is neutral, meaning that the solution contains an equal number of hydrogens and hydroxyls. You can drink pure water. And you can drink water on either side just a little bit, a little bit uh, acidic, a little bit alkaline. You can, you can still drink it. Pure water, neutral. Look at your human blood right below pure water on that scale. Your, uh, your blood is a pH of between 7.35 and 7.45. So your blood is slightly alkaline. And that's where it has to stay for the enzymes to work. It has to be slightly alkaline. If it gets outside that range toward 8 or toward 6, it, it damages the uh, enzymes. We'll talk about how they get denatured or destroyed by adverse pH. Uh, so there's an inverse relationship between hydrogens and hydroxyls on here. Um, as you see um, from 7, as you go to 6, to 5, to 4, to 3, to 2, to 1, the hydrogen ion concentration increases as you go up. There are more and more hydrogens, fewer and fewer hydroxyls. As you go from 7 toward 14, there are more and more hydroxyls and fewer and fewer hydrogens. It's like a, a wedge, uh, two little uh, wedges laying next to each other uh, or on top of each other. And in the center where the wedges are equal, that would be your pH of 7. And each end shows how the wedge tapers on one and, and builds up on the other. Uh, one increases, one decreases. <clears throat> A pH below 7 is an acid. So 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Those are, that's the acid range. While above 7 is a base. Your, remember, your, your, uh, your blood is slightly alkaline, slightly basic. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. The difference in concentration of hydrogen ions differs by 10 times between values. Okay, so when you go from 7 to 6, there's 10 times more hydrogen ions at 6 than there were at 7. So it says a pH of 5 has 10 times more hydrogen ions than, a, than an acid of pH 6. It does. If you went from, five, from 7 to 5, it'd be 10 times 10, there's 100 times more hydrogen ions at 5 than there were at 7. If you went from 7 to 4, 7 to 6, 10. 6 to 5 times 10 is 100. Times 10 to 4, it's 1,000. There's 1,000 times more hydrogen ions at 4 than there were at 7. And you go the opposite direction, 7 to 8, there's 1,000 times fewer hydrogen. 7 to 9, a hundred times, well, seven to eight, I'm sorry, seven to eight is ten times, seven to nine 
is 100 times fewer hydrogens than hydroxyls. So as you go from 7 towards 0, every value is a tenfold increase. And you go 7 to 14, every, every value is a, a tenfold decrease. Acids, bases, and buffers. An acid, the definition of an acid, a hydrogen ion donor. Something that when you dissolve it in water, donates hydrogen ions. Okay, like uh, there's a molecule HCl, hydrogen chloride. When that's dissolved in water, it makes um, sulfuric acid. And we'll see that in just a second. Uh, so it releases hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. Reacts with bases to form salts. They taste sour, like uh, um, vinegar is sour. That's acetic acid. Uh, turns litmus red. We don't use red litmus paper anymore, but it was blue. If it turns red, it's an acid. A base, a hydrogen ion acceptor, also releases hydroxyl ions. So a, a, a molecule that releases hydroxyl ions into the environment is a base. Reacts with an acid to form a salt, and it turns litmus blue. So red paper would turn blue, which we don't use that. We use uh, range paper now. It's different. A buffer, a substance that minimizes changes in hydrogen and hydroxyl ion concentrations. So a buffer is a substance which will stabilize a pH. If something tries to become too acidic, it, it buffers it down and tries to keep it at that pH value. You have many buffers in your body that maintain your pH of 7.35 to 7.45 because you drink a lot of acidic stuff. Coffee, tea, juices, cokes, those are all acids. And your buffer systems take care of that so that you can stay in that pH range. And then uh, they convert it to other molecules that you, you avoid from your body, like urea is NH4. It ties up hydrogen ions to get rid of them out of your, out of your system. A salt, a precipitate that results from the mixing of an acid. Now, <clears throat> this sodium chloride I don't have it on this slide, I don't think, but the hydrogen chloride dissolved in water is going to come apart into hydrogen ions with H plus and chloride ions, Cl minus. The base, when it's dissolved in water, dissociates into sodium ions, Na plus, hydroxyl ions, OH negative. Well, the NH plus and the Cl minus come together to form on the right, there's your sodium chloride, your salt. The hydrogen's acid, uh, hydrogen from acid uh, combines with the hydroxyl from the base to form H2O, the water. Something happened to the arrows. So this shows how acids can be used to buffer bases. Bases can be used to buffer acids. And the product is water, which is neutral, and salt. Neither one of those has to do with pH. So it can, you can use an acid to buffer a strong base, and you can use a base to buffer a strong acid to change the pH. pH in the environment. Um, the soil pH, there is a pH in the soil, and it has to be maintained in order for plant life to grow in it. Uh, you know, like your grass and your trees and stuff. So there are soil fungi in there. There are mycorrhizoids, uh, fungi. And they're responsible for breaking down minerals so that plants have some minerals to take up into your, you know, your grasses and your trees. Once I uh, had a, a trash can full of potting soil that got left out in the rain for a few weeks, got left out, I took it over to dump it out in the grass. When I was dumping it out, I smelled a high ammonia, a lot of ammonia, so a lot of ammonia in that, in that trash can. So I stopped. Well, that area that I poured that ammonia out on changed the pH so bad that for roughly one year, no grass would grow on that, on that soil. It took a year's worth of rain and you know, diffusing out that uh, pH for the pH to uh, reach a, a normal one that the soil fungi could live in and then grass could grow in it. You know, plants can grow in it again. It took about a year. So I changed the soil pH, and I can testify for that. Well, aquatic pHs can also be changed. And aquatic pH of, se of several 
uh, lakes around the world have been changed by mining industries where they use water to rinse out or process what they're getting out of the earth. And it, the uh, water has a adverse pH and it goes into the uh, lakes. The lakes try to buffer it so the minerals are leached out of the lake. And then eventually the lake cannot buffer anymore. And uh, the pH is adverse for plant life and animal life. So that the lakes do not have any uh, thing growing in them as far as algae, any plants. They don't have any fish, any minnows. They're all dead. The pH is, is outside of the range they can live in. And the plant life along the border has been affected too. It's kind of, uh, don't, they don't grow as well. And the further away you get from that, that water mass, the plants grow better. Now acid rain is a pH of uh, 5.2. So 5.2 is and below is acid rain. The causes of acid rain are the burning of fossil fuels and they, they produce sulfates, which get in the atmosphere. And when it rains, the water combines with the hydrogen sulfide gas to make a weak sulfuric acid. And when it lands on uh, stones, rocks, concrete, your car, over time, it starts to dissolve the minerals out of the rocks and starts to dissolve your paint off of your, your car. And so over time, acid rain will break those down. That's why a lot of statuary uh, over in Rome is now in museums because the environments have changed enough to where if they get rained on, they're going to dissolve. So that's the impact. We have to repaint stuff. We have to uh, reproduce concrete. We have to protect uh, mineral structures. This slide is, sh this slide is showing uh, a lake and you can see that the plant life up close look at those trees they're looking kind of scraggly they're not growing the best that they can grow because the ph of that water is not conducive to that plant growth but the further back you see a nice uh, nice little uh, pine tree here so further away from the the water so that lake has some problems you look at the pictures on the bottom here of this statue uh, this was taken i think over in europe somewhere a while back and you see what the statue used to look like and several, several years later, what it looks like then. I'm sure it's even worse off now. But beforehand, you can see facial features, the uh, pleats in the cloth, fingers, and now you can't see it. It's going to just dissolve that statue away. It's just acid rain, the effects of acid rain. That's why it's such an important thing.